September 17th, 2013. Rockstar released GTA 5, the latest installment in the Grand Theft Auto franchise and their most ambitious title at the time, featuring a vast open world, a huge list of customizable vehicles, and a fleshed out story that was playable from three perspectives. A story that we all know too well. Overall, a great game. But if I asked you to name me the best mission in the GTA 5 story, I'm sure I'd be met with a myriad of answers. The jewel store job, blitz play maybe, the big score of course, well, all valid answers, but I'm here to tell you that you're wrong. Because the best mission in the GTA 5 story is the fourth mission in the game, Complications. Franklin pays a visit to his workplace at the time, Premium Deluxe Motorsport, where he runs into owner Simeon Yetarian, the corrupt Armenian businessman that sells people cars they can't afford. And as usual, he has a job for Franklin. Apparently, Jimmy DeSanta, Michael's son, jerking off while he plays their fucking game, is late on his payments for the car that he just purchased. And Simeon fears he's going to total the car before he's even paid it off. I have this bad feeling that he will do more damage to the car than we can get back from him in the exorbitant interest rate payment. And he wants that goddamn car back. Just go and get it. So as Franklin, you have to drive to Michael's house, climb over the gate, knock out the gardener, clamber onto the roof, sneak through the house and steal the car. But plot twist, Michael is in the car. You get held at gunpoint, drive through the dealership window, beat the living shit out of Simeon and then the mission ends. Now I'm sure you're probably thinking, why exactly is that the best mission in the game? Well you see, you may not realise it, but this mission is actually a pivotal turning point in the GTA 5 story. Sure, you unlock Michael as a playable character, but more importantly, when you complete it, you unlock the ability to play tennis and golf. I hate this fucking game. PGA Tour 2K21, more like GTA Tour 5. X2 add backspin? Oh, well, I don't mind if I do. Now, not only are these games fun and well-made, works of art, if you will, but they're also prime examples of the games within video games. The word immersion gets thrown around a lot in the gaming industry, especially in regards to open world games. How real the world looks and feels, how alive the world seems, and how the world alone can pull you in and keep you interested. And one thing I always see sweep under the radar when it comes to the topic of immersion is the choice for developers to add side games and activities to their worlds. Sure, it's a small addition, but in my opinion, it goes a long way in making a world more believable. It seems that Rockstar always hit the nail on the head when it comes to interacting side games and activities, whether it's playing basketball on the courts of San Andreas, air hockey in the Ballad of Gay Tony, or arm wrestling in GTA 5. And of course, we can't forget in GTA 4 when Roman would always call you up with the iconic line, Nico, it's Roman, let's go bowling. You know what, Roman, I will go bowling, because that shit was fun as fuck. Nice throw. Yeah, baby. Hey Roman, I got your text. Hug you while rubbing you against my huge sweaty moobs, then kiss your cheeks, and then kiss you on the lips, and let a long hard belch into your mouth. And although they aren't games, we can't just skip past GTA 5 cinemas, being able to watch a range of short films. My wife says I could put a clothespin on her nipple. So here we go. <laughs> and of course, the strip club. Boobies. And you bet whenever I played as Trevor, I'd be a regular at the Yellow Jack Inn in Sandy Shores, where after a couple of beers, I'd smash any hillbilly at a game of darts. <laughs> it's not just GTA either. Rockstar's latest release, Red Dead Redemption 2, between the sweeping landscapes and dense forests, Rockstar added a range of playable tabletop games. Dominoes in the camp, Blackjack in the taverns, or a dodgy game of Five Finger Fillet where you could just spam your fingers on the keyboard so your hand moved at hyperspeed. And the fact that you could come across small groups of men playing the odd poker game in the back room of a train station was always such a cool touch in my opinion. And it wasn't like these games were isolated either, snapping your way to another screen. The transition between walking around to playing cards was virtually seamless, watching Arthur sit down at the table as he was dealt his cards and chips. Plus, the game world would still always be moving around you as you played, making it feel like you were just another passerby stopping for a quick game of poker at the bar, only making it feel more spontaneous and real. Ha 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 ha! is gonna be walking bow-legged tonight. 
But Rockstar aren't the only ones. Take the masterpiece of a game that is Watch Dogs 1, where you play this legendary hacker, Aiden Piss. And actually, Ubisoft managed to work some pretty inventive games into Watch Dogs. Chess logic puzzles that were just challenging enough that they were still fun, or an interactive drinking game where you had to outdrink your opponent by moving your analog stick to various points on the screen and press the corresponding button. Seems easy enough, but as you got more and more pissed, the analog stick would become much harder to control, making the game pretty goddamn difficult. Raymond. And how can I talk about Watch Dogs 1 and not mention poker? But this wasn't just any ordinary poker game. As the big brained hacker you were, you could secretly gain access to the nearby security cameras and sneakily look over the shoulders of your fellow players to see their hands, giving you a major leg up in the game. You naughty, naughty. You teasing me, you naughty, naughty. I remember thinking this was such an inventive addition when I first saw it. Whoever came up with this idea at Ubisoft needs a promotion. Or an Assassin's Creed Black Flag, where after sailing the seas, you could find a number of merchants on the docks that you could play games with, like Checkers or Nine Man's Morris, where I had absolutely no clue how to play the game, so I just randomly moved the pieces around and hoped I'd win. But it was still fun. Even Sleeping Dogs, an open world action game where you played through an ongoing triad dispute in the bustling streets of Hong Kong, featuring a dynamic and extremely fun combat system. But when you weren't beating the fuck out of gang members, you could always wander out to the gambling den in the form of a dingy freighter just off the coast and play a quick game of mahjong for a small amount of money in the gambling hall as you heard the ambient sounds of aggressive Chinese voices echoing around the room. Overall, I guess what I'm trying to say is albeit a small feature of a game, I've always held an appreciation for developers choosing to add small interactive side games and activities to their worlds that you, the player, can take part in. Besides being generally enjoyable to play, they allow for a short break in regular gameplay, whether it's stopping by at a tavern for a quick game of blackjack between your western adventures in Red Dead 2, or practicing your backswing on a court in downtown Los Santos in GTA 5, these small additions make a game world and their characters feel a lot more believable and alive, giving you some freedom, not making you feel like you're playing as a two-dimensional character that's locked into a main mission storyline. I mean, even Barnyard let you play pool as a fucking cow. And with all of that said, goodbye.